So I'll say this about Survivor Series. There was some good. Actually, some really good. There was also some bad. And when it comes to the ladies in particular, a major step back in the women's revolution, there was an awful lot of bad. All starting off with the first match of the show, this five-on-five-on-five five five women's Survivor Series tag match. Good God, what a cluster of you-know-what this became. It was choppy, it was sloppy, it was hard to follow the action, hard to know who was in, who wasn't. You know, you had people entering at random times after somebody was eliminated. You had some surprising eliminations. You had overbooking to the hell. Like, what the hell do you have... The women from NXT, many of whom had just competed in a War Games match the previous night, they come out here, and they're selling no injuries or no worse for the wear whatsoever, to then have two of the team members of NXT leave due to injury, only to have them come back later on in the night. Like, this was just mind-numbingly bad on so many different levels. Like, the one point in time, you've got freaking... I just can't, the, the, the basics of the stupidity of this are just mind-numbing. There's a pinfall attempt that Sasha Banks breaks up in order to then get the pin herself, instead of allowing the one person to pin the other, so then she could pin the other person. And does this make any damn sense to any freaking buddy? Absolutely not. And what's really astoundingly stupid about all of this is, whereas the night before, you know a lot of the people that are watching Survivor Series probably also watch TakeOver War Game Chicago, know damn good and well that Rhea Ripley and Candice LeRae beat the other team led by Shayna Baszler they beat them four against two. Four against two. And now you get here to this moment in time, and Rhea Ripley is struggling with Sasha freaking Banks of all people. To where you have to have two of her other team members that left earlier due to injury come back to help her to beat Sasha Banks. How in the hell are you going to sit there and build her up as a monster one night, and then the next night she's got to use hoodwink and bullshit in order to beat Sasha Banks? That's not how you build up a monster. And it's even like it was a theme of the night with WWE by capitulating to the NXT nerds. Yes, let's use one of our big four pay-per-views to try and build up a show that gets a third of the viewership of freaking SmackDown and less than half of the viewership of Raw. But even when we do that, we're going to sit there and always have to be some type of crap whenever somebody from NXT wins. Look at this match. Perfect example. Rhea Ripley needs help to beat Sasha freaking Banks. Give me a break. This match was an abortion. Everybody damn good and well knows it. Luckily for the next match, Nakamura, Strong, and Styles, the three mid-card champions, that wasn't a tough act to follow. And they did an adequate job. Adequate is all I can say. But even here, what are you going to say? Roddy wins? Even though somebody else has to finish her first and then he happens to get the pinball. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's just was something the whole night. It's like, we're going to put NXT over, but we're not really going to put NXT over, which begs me the question, why the hell are you putting NXT over? Nonetheless, I digress. At least I can say for Nakamura, Strong, and Styles, it was an infinitely better match than that 5-on-5-on-5 five on five on five women's tag match, and that's saying about absolutely nothing. Then the NXT Championship. Now, you're noticing a trend here. We're doing an awful lot of featuring of NXT, and up to and including having an NXT title match. If you wanted to have an NXT title match on the weekend, I'm sorry, then you reconfigure the damn show, and you have that title match occur on War Games. You don't waste Survivor Series here with this indie-fed bullcrap. And, and the Chicago crowd, who you would think would be so into it, Oh, you can't do Killian Dane. You can't do Damian Priest. You got to do Pete Dunne, the bruiserweight, because then you've got the heel face dynamic. Like any of you geeks ever give a crap about heel face dynamics anymore? Well, I can tell you what. The Chicago crowd was so enraptured, enthralled, and riveted to buy this match that their silence spoke volumes until the last couple of minutes. Now you look at this match. It felt like a pre-show match with two pre-show level competitors. I'm sorry. Like, golly. Like this. 
This is the type of match that we're getting on big four pay-per-views nowadays, and you wonder why wrestling is as uncool as it ever has been. Uncool as it ever has been. And speaking of uncool, by the way, yo, that red light. I didn't watch any of the Bray Wyatt-Seth Rollins matches for the title. Because I skipped Hell in a Cell because I figured that was going to be an abortion. It was. I didn't watch Crown Jewel for my own personal reasons. So here, I was kind of intrigued. Let's see what everybody's harping on about with this red light. And oh my God. Yes. This is like Kenny Roster, Rogers Roaster sign, Seinfeld level is bad. I mean, my eyes hurt watching this. My eyes hurt afterwards watching this. The match itself was solid. But the whole time I'm sitting there thinking to myself, do we really need to have this red light running the entire time? Thank God I wasn't somebody that was there in Rosemont at the Allstate Arena actually watching this in person because I could only imagine how bad that experience is. If you want to do the red light at key moments or at signature spots, so be it. But do we really need to do the red light the entire time? I mean, my eyes literally hurt watching and I cannot be the only one. But at least Bray Wyatt wins here. Is from what I saw from a lot of people, infinitely better than anything that Bray Wyatt, or excuse me, The Fiend and Seth Rollins had done in their matches, which isn't a surprise because Daniel Bryan is much better than Seth Rollins. So at least here at this point in the show, even with the annoyance of the red light, it was starting to turn around a little bit for me. And then we got to the men's Survivor Series tag match. And on so many levels, this match was everything that the women's match wasn't. This match was fantastic. The match of the night. God, this was so good. It was so, so good. You know, Ciampa got good run. And, it, you know, the, the back and forth that they had between Baron Corbin and Roman Reigns worked. And Roman Reigns ultimately got one over on him. You know, Baron Corbin sabotaging his own team at one point. That was cool. You started teasing the stuff with doing the old shield spot. and you Just so many things about this match really worked. And then when you got down to the end, it's Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns and Keith Lee. Damn it, the whole time I'm sitting there watching, I'm like, I wish Smokey was here for this. Because if Smokey was still around, you couldn't deny Keith Lee. It would be straight to the Royal Rumble and the main event shot at WrestleMania. And you know it's true. He'd be like, Keith Lee, you damn right. But man, oh man, seeing Keith Lee at that spot in that moment, it, it was almost too good because now Vince is actually going to pay attention to him. And now that Vince is actually going to pay attention to him, I worry for him. I fear for him because you can look at him and you can see, my God, this man can make you money until Vince touches him and teams him with Braun Strowman. It makes them polar and grizzly, the gay dancing bears, or some stupid crap like that. And thinking about Braun Strowman, man, go from a guy that got so much push and so much attention to here. We are a Survivor Series, lame ass count out. It's not protecting him at this point, it's just doing nothing for him. But it was a big spot for Keith Lee, a big moment for Keith Lee. At least Seth Rollins didn't win this damn match, because that would have been too much for me. It's one thing to have him sit there and beat Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. It's another thing to have him beat him again at freaking SummerSlam. If he'd come back here at Survivor Series and had him beat Keith Lee and Roman Reigns in that final three of that match to be the show survivor, then it just would exacerbate so many of the problems you have with Seth Rollins not being cool and being annoying and grating on everybody and so on and so forth. So this match finished out well. Sure. They're getting big on Roman Reigns, probably launching him towards The Fiend at WrestleMania, perhaps. Who knows? You couldn't have Keith Lee win here. Nor did you need to have Keith Lee win here. He got to a point where he did enough. It was a big enough spotlight, a big enough moment for him, where he actually didn't need the victory. I thought the booking of this, unlike the women's match, was so much better. I thought the flow of this match, unlike the women's match, was so much better. Like, if you're comparing these two matches, both of the traditional Survivor Series tag matches, to me, I'm sorry, there is absolutely no comparison. 
Then you shifted over to the WWE Championship match, and I will say it was short, sweet, and to the point, and exactly what the hell it needed to be. Ray and Dominic got a little bit of a measure of revenge for a moment in time on Brock Lesnar. You teased the stuff with the steel pipe or whatever the hell you want to call it, the lead pipe. You got the double 619 spot. That's cool. And then Brock Lesnar wins. No need to reinvent the wheel here. No need to overthink it. No need to shred the bounds of believability or anything like that. This match was a good blow-off, a good payoff to this. And it wasn't 20 to 30 damn minutes. Because God knows we have enough other matches on this show that are way too damn long. So it's nice to have a short one kind of mix it up. I, I enjoyed the match quite a bit. You know, it's about what you're going to get out of Brock. And in this situation like this, I appreciate that some of the Brock matches are going to go shorter because it stands out more from the crowd. It does. And, I mean, were you really going to have Ray win the belt? Maybe you could have made an argument for it, especially if it came Velasquez interference, but nah. He still doesn't come out of this looking bad. He looks better. Ray Mysterio goes from a few months ago not really mattering to he just wrestled for a world title on a big four pay-per-view. It's a good spot to be in. It's a good spot for Dominic to be in. Everybody won from this. Unlike the main event. Oh, my God. The women's triple threat at the end of the show was so bad that I even withheld doing the review last night very early this morning until I watched it again because I thought maybe I was just tired. Maybe I was just being too negative. I wanted to look at it from a fresh set of eyes to make sure that it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. And it was every bit as bad, if not worse. The guys have had plenty of main events over the years that they've bombed. But now you're talking about two big four pay-per-view main events that the ladies have frankly kind of underwhelmed and disappointed. And this one was just all levels of atrocious even compared to WrestleMania. Whereas WrestleMania, you could argue it kind of worked, but the finish kind of fell flat. Like everything about this just really fell flat. It was slow. It was plodding. It was methodical. Becky didn't do crap. It's like you put Bailey in there to be a kind of a workhorse, but then she's just going to be the jobber bitch. Where Shayna Baszler, so many of her matches just have kind of this slow, methodical pace to them. It's really, really hard to get interested. You know, when the crowd is chanting negative things towards the ladies in this main event match, you know something's gone wrong here. Something's gone awry. And to all the people that thought something big like a Ronda Rousey return or something unfounded like that was going to happen here, I think you found out your answer. It was just designed ultimately to be a Becky Lynch showcase. Because even though Shayna Baszler won, and here's the whole point again about, are you going to put NXT over? Why would you put NXT over? And if you did, why in the hell would you put them over in the way that you did? You have Shayna Baszler submit Becky, or excuse me, Bailey, just to then have Becky Lynch do her best John Cena impression and undercut the whole finish of the damn match just so that way she could stand tall at the end after putting Shayna Baszler through a damn table. And it didn't work. It was lame. It sucked. This is now twice. This is twice you have put Becky Lynch into big time spots and the matches have been bubkiss. Bubkiss. If you're going to talk about being the man, if you're going to get all this push and all this force, then by God as hell, you better be able to carry the match and deliver the damn goods. And not surprisingly, she did it. And none of them did in this match. Good God, that was brutal. And a horrible way to end this show. So yeah, when you look at this Survivor Series, it's just going to be one of those largely forgettable events, frankly. You might remember it as like a Keith Lee breakout moment or something like that, but that's about it. None of these matches are truly going to go down in history, although that men's 5 on 5 on 5 tag match was really, really good. I don't think it goes into the all-time great category. None of the other matches on this show were memorable or legendary. You really didn't have a whole lot of truly memorable or legendary spots or moments. Just largely one of those forgettable shows that was bookmarked by two absolutely horrendous women's matches. Horrendous. One due to booking, and one due to crappy working and match production by the agent. It's bad. Feel free to let me know what you want. But if you're going to do this with the ladies, 
They better be better than this. My God, that was horrible.